We are the common denominator in all of our relationships. Love that. You know, so it's not just that all men cheat, it's that you keep dating cheaters. You know, it's not that all of them don't communicate, it's that maybe you don't communicate that well either. How do we find the right person? <laughs> I, my, I have a new podcast and it literally, the episode that dropped today was uh, 10 things to, that you need to know to find the right person. Oh my God. Well, yeah, <laughs> great place to start. Yeah, <laughs> what start. do I need to know? You have to know yourself. Wow, I like that. Yeah, you have to know yourself. And a lot of people um, don't know themselves enough to know what is really not only important to them, but what it is that they absolutely need in a partner. Because it's really easy to say all the things that you want, but knowing what you need, you have to understand yourself and your psychology. Hmm. You have to understand what you've been through. You have to understand where your weaknesses are, your vulnerabilities are, and what's going to be right for you. And then you, of course, need to know what your values are because relationships can be hard. They can be very labor intensive, but they're going to be a lot easier and a lot more fulfilling if you are clear about what's most important to you from a value perspective and then date someone who has similar values to you. Not, not who's exactly the same as you, but values, some, some things. Fundamentally, your values are the same. What are some examples of like values? Okay, so for example, you really value wellness and taking care of your body and taking care of your health. You might be attracted to a woman who does not value that, but I can guarantee you that if you were to try to be in a committed long-term relationship with her, that's going to be very challenging for mm. you. So that would be like one thing is like what people think about, you know, their health and wellness. Money is a big one. Um, lifestyle, like how you like to live, how you like to spend your money, how you like to save your money. Um, if, if someone is in the position where they could have kids, you know, or they're even thinking about it, like you have to be in alignment with with that, with just like family and stuff like that. Like, do you want kids? Do you not want kids? Um, other values are around uh, spirituality, religion. Like I said, those are the big ones. So sex, money, religion, spirituality, health, wellness. Um, and also just how, you know, there are people, their value system is that they really want to give back to the world in some way. Um, how they do that or how someone else does that is not really as important, but that there is some sort of calling to contribute to something outside of yourself. Like if you live a life like that, um, living a life with someone who values that as well, and they may value it very differently. That might be like giving to animals. That might be giving to a child, but just having that in their nature because your natures have to be fundamentally aligned. And that doesn't mean like, you know, differences are important. You know, a lot of people will be like, I just want to meet like the equivalent of me. And I'm like, gross. Like, no, <laughs> no, you don't. Actually, you really don't. That would be really boring. So the differences are important. Um, but I always say, figure out how you probably don't have to figure it out, but think about how, what a perfect Sunday afternoon is to you mm. or a perfect Saturday night and make sure among other things that the person that you actually commit to is on board with that. And it's so important. Yeah. Like a Sunday afternoon and a Saturday night, how you like to spend that is, I think it tells a lot about a person. God, what a great like framework. Yeah, absolutely. So if someone likes to go out and party and they're super social and and you're someone who's like, well, actually a perfect Sunday afternoon is like working out or like going for breakfast or like never leaving bed some Sundays, like that's going to be difficult, you mm. know, or like a perfect Saturday night is like, you know, maybe go out for dinner and then come home and watch a movie and chill. Mm. And then the other person's like, I got to meet, I got to do it. Then like, that's, you're going to run into problems. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I love that. How do we... How do we, because uh, I feel like people people are listening to this, uh, I'm 30 years old. I, I, I couldn't possibly know more about myself, right? But like, mm -hmm. 
I feel like self inquiry, self discovery is something that, um, is, uh, for as, for how intuitive it is, is something that's like relatively rare. It is. People tend rare. to not be super self-aware. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have this thing that I said, the road to relationship hell is paved with charming people who haven't worked on themselves. Um, so that's actually a really important value. So if growth and personal development is a value, um, I think it's going to be really important for you to, for one, to find someone who values that as well. Because it's rare, because honestly, our growth is directly proportionate to how willing we are to look at ourselves and to look at the hard parts of ourselves and tell the truth to ourselves. So we're not going to grow unless we are looking at the parts of ourselves that we're like, <laughs> that's not, that's a little unsavory. Like, I wish that wasn't there. Okay, well, it's there. What am I going to do about it? Like, maybe I need to accept it more or um, maybe because of that, I have certain behavioral patterns in a relationship that's really, really screwing me over and I have to figure that out. That takes a lot of courage. Hmm. Yeah. Also, especially when people that are around us are not necessarily always going to be honest with us about our shortcomings. Right. Right. Like, I mean, I have friends that have quirks, <laughs> <laughs> shortcomings to say, to say the least. And, uh, but you know, you, you love these people and yes. you, you want to, um, see the good in people. Yes. And so it makes it kind of like, I, I feel like it makes it uh, easy for people to kind of live within their own little like echo chambers. Absolutely. But I think that what prompts people to change is that if you have had enough relationship pain, you know, if you've had things that haven't worked out and you're like scratch, I mean, that's what happened to me. It's like at some point years ago, I was just scratching my head. I was like, what, 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 what is this all about? Because we are the common denominator in all of our relationships. Love that. You know, so it's not just that all men cheat, it's that you keep dating cheaters. Mm. It's not that all of them, um, whoever them is, you know, it's not that all of them don't communicate, it's that you, maybe you don't communicate that well either, or you don't understand them. So we have to be able to say, um, you know, it's not that they're all narcissists, is that you're attracted to narcissists. Interesting. Or you tolerate nonsense for too long. So that's really what it's all about. You have to be able to say, okay, this isn't working, or it's not, at least it's not where I want it to be. Why? And People can definitely say, well, you know, give a million reasons why it's not their fault. And it's not about blame, but it's about responsibility. So you have to be able to look in the mirror and be like, okay, what is my picker busted? You know, um, how am I? It's, it, these are two really important questions, I think, for people to ask themselves. How am I an amazing partner? And how have I been perhaps at times a nightmare to be in a relationship with? <laughs> Good questions to ask. Yeah, not, not easy, but you have to also balance it. Like, where am I great? Where am I? Because the epidemic that I see today is low self-esteem. Hmm. And, um, and it's difficult because even with low self-esteem, you have to see where you can be a nightmare in a relationship, but you also, it's so important for people to see where they're wonderful and that they're worthy of um, being treated well. Where do you think that comes from? The low self-esteem? Yeah. A few places. Well, one, it, one place is it can come from childhood, you know. Um, there's so many different ways in which it, it presents itself, you know. One way would be, let's say you grew up in a family where um, you have siblings and maybe one sibling, this is sort of a random example, one sibling is special needs in some way. And so what happens in the family culture is that all the attention goes to the child that has special needs. And, um, and then the other kids are having to kind of, it's no, 
no one's to blame here. It's just what happens, right? And then that child gets sort of forgotten about or ignored a little bit or not as much attention on them. And so then that child might overcompensate by trying to be the best at something or trying to get their parents' attention. And this is going on into adulthood on an unconscious level. And so, um, and then their self-esteem is, you know, I have to do all these things to be enough for mom and dad because, you know, I'm not enough. Of course, this is just a perception. They are enough. Um, they just had a special needs uh, sibling. Another uh, thing is that, uh, you know, especially in just culture in general, women in particular have been fed a certain level of conditioning where, um, which is so misguided that we have to be perfect or look a certain way or be really, really nurturing. So what I see is a lot of women wanting to, especially in the dating process, in the very early dating process, they're trying to please the person a lot. They're trying to be, they're trying to overgive and show how I could be like, I could be the woman that you take home to meet your parents. And so she's trying extra, extra hard, which is just, um, just very misguided. That's not usually what gets someone to be attracted to you. I mean, yes, when you're later on in the relationship, but in the beginning stages, it's, it's confidence is usually what goes a longer way. Um, low self-esteem, if there's been any abuse in your family, like that's definitely going to uh, very, very strongly impact how a child develops and their sense of worth develops. So there's, there's a spectrum yeah, for sure. So what happens when you bring low self-esteem into a relationship? Yeah. Good question. And an important question. Um, a few things happen. You, uh, don't ask for what you need because you, number one, don't think that your needs are, um, that you deserve your needs to be met. And this might not be a conscious thought, but this is what's happening. So you don't ask for what you need. You're terrified of losing the other person. So you'd rather not rock the boat. You'd rather just keep the peace. And so then you just don't ask for what you need. And then what you do is then what happens is that then the, the power dynamic is really thrown off and the other person has really all the power. And it's not necessarily their fault. It's a dynamic. Like it's really important that people see, I mean, unless it's a very clear example of abuse, that most of the time what's happening is that there is a dynamic. It's not usually there's a victim and a villain. There's two people who are in relationship with one another, creating some sort of dynamic where they're both playing out their old wounds with one another. And there's all sorts of scenarios that can happen. Um, it plays out in accepting, tolerating abuse. I mean, there's no one ever who's been in a relationship who has been emotionally, verbally, or physically abused who felt good about themselves. Mm. It's just impossible. Yeah, maybe they feel good. Sorry. Maybe they feel good about themselves at work, but they don't feel good about themselves in other ways. Yeah. Cause it's only that condition that would allow somebody to like accept being abused. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, sometimes low self-worth, low self-esteem presents itself as, um, I'm just going to do everything to get love. So I'm going to please you. I'm going to, you know, unconsciously manipulate you. I'm going to strategize um, to get you to be more in love with me or to be more interested in me. Um, yeah, it's, it's, an, it's not good. Hmm. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Yeah, no, I mean, it definitely seems like a, like it, um, like to enter into a healthy re relationship, a precondition should be to um, to really know your self worth and to yes. cultivate self love. Yes, and and this is the this is this is an interesting topic because there's a lot in the current psych zeitgeist right now of saying you don't have to love yourself and to be in a healthy relationship, and then and then there's a whole other camp that says you know you have to love yourself to be in a relationship. I think that it falls somewhere in between. Number one, we are always going to struggle with certain parts of ourselves. And I think that 
the the journey towards feeling quote unquote worthy is lifelong. I think that we can feel worthy in a lot of different ways, but we're going to I mean in in work we'll we'll face imposter syndrome, we'll face comparing ourselves to others. Um so this sense of 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 feeling worthy is sort of like a lifelong job, but to you need to understand, one needs to know that they fundamentally have value just because they're a living, breathing organism on this earth. And if you don't love yourself enough to see that you are worthy enough, of, about, uh, enough to have needs, to express your needs, to be in a relationship where there's reciprocated love and affection to love yourself enough to to walk away from something that's not working for you forget if it's like it could be that it's not abusive at all but just that you it's not right mm. so you have to um you have to have that but you know i recently coached a client who really struggled with self-love and consequently would date a lot of men who um, really was not right for her, didn't see her value. And it was just one sort of toxic cycle after the next. But she met someone really great who really saw her for her. And she had the wisdom enough to be like, okay, this scares me. <laughs> what's wrong with him that he sees this value in me but luckily she had me by her side to because she could have easily sabotaged that but at least she could say to herself this is good this is right and then you learn to love yourself more when you're in a relationship with someone who really sees you and accepts you for who you are you love you learn to love the parts of yourself that you still struggle even in your baseline of confidence that you still struggle to accept within yourself that you still question within yourself and then someone sees that and loves you and accepts you for that it's incredibly healing and beautiful and that's how it should be that that is what i want everyone's standard to be you're not going to get the perfect partner we are all flawed we all will act like a teenager once in a while um you're not going to get everything you want. Chances are the person that you might fall in love with doesn't look exactly maybe archetypically like the person you've always been attracted to, but yet who cares? Like you have to throw all of that out the window and um, make the standard is that I want us to really see each other and love each other for who we are right now, not who we're going to be in five or 10 years. But now, as if we would never change and really, really accept one another. And that's that's what it's all about in my book. Yeah. What is that fear <clears throat> at the onset of relationships? Like when somebody starts to indicate that they're actually really into you and people get like afraid. They, they feel that uh, compulsion to, re to recede mm -hmm. or retract. What is that fear yeah. all about? Are you asking for yourself? <laughs> Ask, ask him for a friend. Ask him for a friend. <laughs> no, it definitely happens to me. I get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I pull back for yeah. sure. I'm, I mean, maybe not as much, not so much now as I did in the past, but yes. it's definitely that I could still, some, when that emotion starts to bubble up, I can, I can feel it and it's very familiar. Yeah. So it's fear, obviously, as you, as you called it, it's fear. It's a little bit of an avoidant tendency, but I don't like to diagnose people avoidant or anxious unless I'm really, I don't like to diagnose anyone with that, but I just think it's thrown around too much. A little bit of an avoidant thing. Um, so it depends what that person associates with love and relationship. Like, do they do they fear their freedom being taken away? Do they fear being controlled? Um, do they fear being vulnerable and really being seen? Because that feeling means you have to be seen, you have to be... Um, yeah, be seen. Some people are really afraid to be seen. Some people are really afraid. If I'm in a relationship, then um, I'm going to be responsible for someone in some way, or I'm going to be have to be accountable to really show up. 
But it's a fear of intimacy, which is really common because when risk, love comes with it risk. So if you love someone, you are basically saying, I am giving you the power to destroy me, my heart. Mm. And so oftentimes that's what people are running away from is that. Wow. Yeah. Pain. That sounds about right. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, I've uh, been in therapy for the past year and a half. So I, uh, actually, my therapist recently <laughs> quit me. She said that I. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you mean she fired you? <laughs> she fired me. Why? No, I think in a good way. Oh, okay. Uh, she said that I've, I've met many of the goals that I, um, you know, that I like set out mm -hmm. to, to meet when I initiated therapy. Right. And she was like, you know, you don't want to stay with a therapist forever. You don't want to create a dependency on, on, on right. a therapist. So I don't know, maybe you have, you have different thoughts, but yeah, she was like, uh, well, let's take a break. I think that's great. Yeah. Yeah. If someone came to me and said, you know, I've been in therapy for tw the same therapist for 20 years, 10 years, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you need to get out. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. It, sh it shouldn't go on forever. Mm. It shouldn't go on forever because if it gets to a point where you go into therapy and then you're just kind of venting and talking about your day, you know, it, no, it, I think goals are good. Yeah. And goals are important. I had a, a very lucky, wonderful therapist in LA. Um, how do people, cause I feel like what happens when you finally meet the person that you decide to enter into a relationship with you, uh, you know, you're always on your A game, like those first couple of months, Yeah. but then inevitably you transition to this point where you start, you know, showing them your C game while mm -hmm. you're still giving your A game to everybody yeah. else. Yes. What's that about? Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like it's like kind of part of the human condition, right? Like yeah, yeah. It's, it's really hard to maintain an appreciative, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, an, uh, like, uh, 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 to maintain appreciation for something that's like always around, right? You habituate. Yes. yes. Like, what 100%. Is that, like, well, yeah. And it's unfortunate, but it's yes. like, I feel like baked into who we are in a way. Yeah. With everything, with absolutely everything. It's like, you know, you live in sunny LA and it's like, oh yeah, the sun's shining, whatever. So the thing that you once think was a, thought was a gift, then, you know, it becomes a given. And so we start to take each other for granted. It has to be a conscious practice to not take the person you're in a relationship with for granted. They can leave you at any moment. Um, so yes, in the beginning, we bring our A game. A lot of people are lying. They don't, you know, they're strategizing. Um, some people, I always use this analogy, which is two people, they're in the beginning of a relationship and they're in the car and they're on their way to a movie and they get lost. Like the person who's driving gets lost. But then there's like this amazing sunset and they're like, who cares that we missed the movie? There's this amazing sunset. Let's watch it. And they're just so present and in the moment. And then cut to two years later, five years, 10 years later, they're in the car again, going to the movies and they get lost. And the same sunset is there. Maybe it's even more beautiful, but they're pissed off and triggered because they missed the movie. Hmm. So it is just, it behooves us. And this is why being in a relationship whether you consider yourself, whether one considers themselves to be spiritual, and I put that in quotation marks or not, or whatever your relationship is with that word or your association is with that word, it really is a spiritual game because stress, personal stress and how we react to our stress is what destroys relationships. So it's not just being in our, in a, bringing our C game to the person that we live with or who we love or we're in a relationship with is it's how much are we just dropping into our C game in general? Whereas when we first met, we were just in a really good state. Um, we were looking at the glass and seeing it half full instead of half empty. And then of course, you know, life gets in the way and life can be really tough and we face a many different challenges and we're gonna go through a lot of pain and people die and people and all sorts of things happen. 
So of course, we're going to go through seasons where one person needs you know, more help or they're not bringing their A game because they're going through something. But that's not the thing that usually breaks people up. It's the every day coming home in a bad mood, you know, putting on the air for everyone else, but being like, yeah, it's okay. I'll come home and just do this because they're just going to be there. That's the taking for granted. Or I don't have to really pay attention to my whatever, my m emotional health, my physical health, because now I got the person. I'm not single anymore. And it's when we're in a relationship that we have to be on top of that even more. And so as much as we have to hold a standard for how someone's going to treat us, we have to raise the standard for ourselves and how we are going to live life and how the, the certain things that we, that we are going to promise ourselves to do in a relationship. You know, and we'll get bogged down by stress and but if you take responsibility, if you say to your honey, like, I'm so sorry, I've not been myself. I haven't been present with you. I haven't been taking care of myself at the level that you deserve and that I deserve and that our relationship deserves. That, that changes right now. This is if you want a relationship that is very much above average. Yeah. Who doesn't? Yeah. I want that. Many people want that and they think, well, if I'm with the right person, that's what's going to bring it to me. But mm. we have to co-create that with someone else. Mm. We have to do it. Yeah, it's like work. Like Yes. It's attention and work. You have to, you know, you have an animal, you have a cat. Like you have to feed the cat. You have to love the cat. It's the same thing. Your relationship has to be that important to you. Yeah, that's the extent of the responsibility that I'm willing to take on. <laughs> but uh, but she, she's worth it. <laughs> um, what about in relationships? I feel like you've got like these like little like when I the, the last long term relationship that I was in. I remember w one like major point of frustration for me was uh, my the, the my ex would um, I would call them. She would she would act out these like little micro aggressions towards me. They mm -hmm. were not, we, they weren't like, they, they would sometimes culminate and become full blown fights, but there were always these, like, I called them like micro cuts, like, like micro aggressions, mm -hmm. um, which were probably a sign that she wasn't, that I was like doing things that she wasn't appreciating and she wasn't fully articulating to me. Um, she was her, resentful. She, yeah, she was like getting, getting resentful. Mm -hmm. I feel like, uh, but I see that like the, the reason why I bring it up is because I see that in like when I have friends that are in long term relationships, mm -hmm. like I see the sort of like little micro cuts yes. that uh, that that people tend to like, you know, they overlook. Maybe it's just because they're in de denial about them. Um, but or they're yeah, so used to receiving them. They're so used to receiving them. And they could be good relationships mm -hmm. at their core. But there's I feel like you, you, you see a lot of that sometimes. Like you'll yeah. be, I'll be at dinner with like my couple friends and you'll see these like little you know, microaggressions from one to the other. And, uh, and it's like, oh, that's kind of awkward, but you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. It's awful. It's called resentment. Hmm. Yeah. And resentment completely destroys relationships too. Man. Yeah. And that's people not communicating. I mean, there's so many things. It's like, they're always looking at their phone. They're never present with me. Um, but it's because we're not taught this in school. Like we're not taught to say what it is we need or with, with, with vulnerability and resoluteness. So there's a time that's really appropriate and it's so important to say to your partner, like, I don't feel like I feel a little invisible to you and it hurts. As opposed to, you don't pay enough attention to me. It's really pissing me off. You're always doing this, you're always doing that. And then the other person is just hearing complaint and then they shut down and then the other person is like, see, they're avoidant, they don't care. And that is like textbook versus it would be so different if someone, if the person who felt unseen was really vulnerable, like this really hurts. Mm. I feel so unseen. I know you're really busy, but I just don't feel as important to you. And it's keeping me up at night. And to be able to connect 
to the feeling that you feel inside, you know? Um, that's very different. And then there's a way to express your needs where it's like, okay, I've asked for something to change. It's not changing. Now I have to sit down and be more firm. And it doesn't mean you lose vulnerability, but there's more directness there. And it would be something like, I need this to change, and this is why. And you list three reasons why this needs to change. And maybe one of those reasons is, I can't be in a, I don't know how to be in a relationship that doesn't have this thing. And I've been clear from the start that this is what I need. This needs to change. Right, there are times like that. But most people are like your ex. <laughs> Who is, you know, there was resentment there and projection there. And usually she probably just felt um, insignificant to you in some way, not important enough in some way, and did not know how to share that in a way where um, if you cared about her, where you, your heart, you would feel that, that vulnerability and you would want to do something about it, yeah. you know, versus just being defensive. Yeah. You're totally right. Is there a way to uh, recover once there is resentment in the relationship? Like is resentment the death knell of the relationship or is it? Um, contempt is. So John Gottman, who's an incredible relationship researcher and psychologist who's written several books with his wife, alone and with his wife. Um, and he talks about the four horsemen of relationship and contempt being the thing that once it gets to contempt, it's really impossible. I mean, once, because contempt is you just the, like, just looking at you makes me want to throw up. Like mm. it's that, it's that intense. And wow. it's very hard. Tell like, me how you really feel. Yeah, exactly. Or it's like, or the way you chew is like grossing me out. Like once you get there, it's, it's, it's over. Can it recover from resentment? Yeah, but usually, usually that's when you need some sort of third party help. Like therapy? Like therapy or a coach or something, some sort of mentor. Yeah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. What are some other, along with contempt, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Like other, other indicators that uh, the relationship has passed its shelf life. Um, <clears throat> so some indicators that it's passed its shelf life is, well, when you're really good friends, but that's really what you are. Hmm. You know, when it's moved to roommate territory, <laughs> which a lot of people can, can relate to because you have to put in the effort to keep passion alive and people get really complacent and they get really, like I said, really stressed out. No one is hot when they're, when they're stressed out. And we don't feel sexy when we're stressed. So we stop doing the things. And it's not even about, yes, there's the low-hanging fruit of, yeah, maybe I should like put a comb through my hair or like put on a cool outfit and like go out for dinner once in a while. Like that stuff is important. But really it's about like the radiance inside. It's like, okay, I'm not like smiling and laughing and being fun and goofy and all those things that create so much rapport and fun and adventure between two people. So past its shelf life is when it's gone to the roommate side for long enough where there's really no more sexual attraction mm. versus, okay, we have to put in some effort, but yes, if we put in the effort, like we can actually get our or that that sexy back mm. you know might be different than it is in the beginning it will be but it could be profound nonetheless um past its shelf life to people who are just criticizing each other all the time but that's usually a sign of contempt and then sometimes past its shelf life is just oh this was really lovely for a certain amount of time but we want two different things and that is okay yeah do you believe in monogamy? I do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Isn't monogamy a different ask, like life term monogamy, a different ask now than it was when it was invented? I mean, I believe in monogamy, but just to play devil's advocate yeah. to the concept, 
Like we're now living to, I don't, I don't know, maybe my generation, we're going to live to 120. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like exactly. monogamy made a ton of sense when our average lifespan was 38. Yeah. Right? Oh my God. Yeah. Well, let me, let me, let me change it. I, I, I believe that monogamy is a choice. And clearly if you are finding that love that you want to spend the rest of your life with in your forties or your 50s, that choice might be a lot easier than when you're in your 20s or your 30s. Because usually by the time you're 40, you've been around the block enough times to know that like the, the shiny, nice object in the beginning, like that's very short lived. And what you usually want is something more meaningful or deeper. I believe it's a choice. And I believe it's a choice that you may, and I believe love is a choice. I believe it's a verb. And I really believe that, um, there is no the one, you choose who the one will be. Mm. And you will likely have to make that choice over and over again. And if you're with someone for a really long time, you're going to have many marriages or many partnerships within one relationship. You're going to go through many, many seasons. And you are going to be asked to make that choice over and over and over again. And so I just think that it's something that you have to decide, do I want to make that choice? Do I want to grow, you know, in such a way that this becomes like almost like a spiritual partnership in some way, but right. it's not, but at the same time, you know, it's to each their own. I think it's really hard for someone in their twenties to be like, yes, this is going to be forever. Some people it really works. Some people really, like they meet someone and it does work. I think the bottom line is that uh, if it doesn't work, it's not necessarily a failure, but just decide, you have to decide what you, want it, what, you, what you want it to be. And the problem that I see so many people today is that they're taking something that really should have been a hot love affair and they're trying to make it into a relationship. And that, those are the relationships that end up being really, they crash and burn really quick. Hmm. So is monogamy a, you know, a difficult thing? Yeah, it can be. And it depends on who you are, your values, your, the decisions you make, your age. Um, and maybe is it going to be harder? Yeah. So maybe it's monogamy for 20 years and then it's monogamy with someone else for five years. Yeah. I feel like they should, like part of the marriage contract should be like every five years you have to like check in and re-sign the deal. Otherwise yeah. it just like expires. Yes. <laughs> That that could be one thing, like double like double opt in. Yeah, on like a five year interval. Well, I think it's actually really clever every year to sit down with your partner and be like, and almost like like a meeting, be like, okay, like how can I be a better? Well, I I think that like people, a vibe check, a vibe check. But I think those vibe checks should be going on all the time. I think that people should be saying all the time to their partner, "How can I be a better partner to you?" That should be like monthly. Yeah. But I feel like people get stuck in this routine where they they inevitably eventually start talking past one another. Yeah. And um, yeah, it, uh, they, they start to ignore the elephants in the room. Yeah, you have to always point out the elephant in the room. People want to avoid the tough conversations. And I understand why. I mean, I certainly have. There's certainly been times where the people, like my ex wanted to like have a hard conversation. I'm just like, no, why do we have to do that right now? Like, can't we just like pretend everything's okay? Like, I don't want to do that. But you have to have, you have to be willing to ask the questions that scare you and have to be willing to listen to the answers that scare you even more. Hmm. Because a relationship needs that kind of truth in it. And people are lying to each other all the time because they're lying to themselves. And that elephant just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So... One thing that I recommend people do is that when they start seeing someone, then they're like, okay, this is actually someone I really want to commit to. Go to couples therapy or couples counseling together preemptively. Mm. Don't wait till something is wrong. Like talk about it now. Talk about the kind of promises that you're going to have with each other. I don't know, draw up a contract if you want to do that. Like this is what it is to be really conscientious and conscious in a relationship. But again, that's a value. And so 
if you want that, then you know that you that you're asking, you're not just asking a lot from your partner, you're asking a lot from yourself. And so you have to be willing to do that. Yeah. Yeah, that that makes sense. How do what's the best way to bring up like difficult topics? You say, Hey babe, when you get a chance, let me know when we can sit down and have a chat. It's no big deal. Just wanted to talk to you about a few things because there's nothing worse. These are the two worst conversation starters. We need to talk, which like I get like start to sweat even when I say it, you yeah. know? And my therapist said <laughs> <laughs> that is the worst. Huh. That is the worst. Don't bring your therapist into the bedroom with you. Interesting. Yeah. Because a lot of triangulations happen. Um, it, it would be it would be different. Like what's different is I had a really good conversation with my therapist, and this is what I learned about myself, and this is what I learned about us, and this is what this is what I want to do better. That's that's lovely. Versus my therapist said that you should or that we should be. When you do that, you create. People are doing this all the time with their therapists, and therapists are doing this unwittingly with their patients. They create triangulations where um, they're then all of a sudden the partner feels like, okay, so you and your therapist against me. And that's not good. So you say, okay, hey, babe. And then the other person might feel a little nervous or a little concerned, but you know, you sit down, you talk and you say, look, I love you. And I care very much about our relationship. And because of that, I feel like there's something that we've been avoiding, or at least I've been avoiding and I'd love to talk about it with you. And you just say it. But you have to always remind yourself that you're doing that in the service of the relationship. If you care enough about your relationship, you are going to have the difficult conversations. You have to literally, the mindset has to be, I love this person and I love our relationship so much. It's like, like, like it's your child. Like I want to take care of it so badly that I'm just not going to let this thing creep up and destroy us. And so you do it. Wow. Any, it's not easy. You know, I'm not, this is not easy stuff. Yeah. <sighs> Any, uh, in terms of like the, the languaging, you know, like w when you do X, I feel mm -hmm. Y. Yes. So when you, when you're always on your phone, you know, when we're out for dinner, I know that you're not intentionally trying to ignore me. But I feel really ignored and I feel really alone. And um, I would love it if we had some understanding where we just put the phones away during dinner so we can really connect. I'm craving more connection with you. I love you. I want to feel more connected to you. When it's something that's a little bit more heated and we want to blame and finger point, you have to be really clear with, this is what I saw you do. This is my interpretation of what you did. This is the story. I'm in my head because this is what happens. People get in their heads. It's the same thing as stress. We get trapped in our heads. We ruminate. We obsess. Then we start to create a whole story, an entire narrative where um, the other person is wrong and we're being wronged. I mean, most of the time when we're fighting with someone, we're not actually fighting with them. We're fighting with the ex they remind us of. We're fighting with the parent they remind us of. We're fighting, we're fighting our fear of actually being vulnerable with this person. So a fight rarely has to do with the actual thing that happened. It's stacked. There's a lot of other things that are happening. So first, the first important, most important part of repair is to be able to acknowledge oneself, um, to oneself, okay, I've been in my head. I have been creating so many stories. And to say that, like, this is what I saw you do. This is like literally what my head is telling me that you did. And I don't think that that was your intention. But my feelings are really real and I feel really insecure. I feel really scared. I feel ugly. I feel whatever it is. That's so important because it's the vulnerability. It's the accountability. But what's equally important is the person on the receiving end not to say some BS like, I'm so sorry you feel that way. Hmm. <laughs> or your feelings are, are, you know, 
that's your responsibility. That's not my responsibility. It always has to be, I'm, I don't want to hurt you. I'm so sorry your feelings are hurt. I'm so sorry I hurt your feelings. Let me clear up whatever story it is in your head. This is actually what my intention was when I did that. Or it might be, you know what? The last thing in the world I want to do is hurt you, but I was really mindless. Like that was not cool what I did. I was unconscious. I was in my head. Mm. I wasn't thinking about your feelings. You were not the most important person to me in that moment and you should have been. I'm sorry. And then the other person, he or she might push a little bit, you know, test a little bit, might push it a little bit. And if you could just be like, yeah, you're right, you're right. And then hopefully they'll soften. And then you hug and you make up. And then that's the thing about fights and arguments. If they can lead to a place where you're closer afterwards, that's really the goal because conflict is a part of relationship. Disharmony is a part of relationship. It's how you deal with it that matters. And it also matters that there's more positive moments than conflict inside of your relationship. Like overall, it should be that you're going to have problems even if you're with the quote unquote right person and you're with someone for a really long time, there's going to be conflict. But at the end of the day, you want to feel like, yeah, my nervous system is really relaxed around this person. This person feels like home and not, you know, not in the way that you pathologize, like in a really good way. You know, like I choose this person. I love this person. I want this person to be a part of my life. I want, I want this person to love me. That's what it's all about. Yeah. I mean, it seems like when you're presenting <clears throat> a partner with, uh, something about them that they're doing that that needs to be addressed it's like you could either stoke a defensive response or you could stoke empathy absolutely and i feel like you should it it, it seems to make the most sense to want to stoke empathy because i mean this person obviously cares about you and uh and if you lead with how you're feeling you know, oh, this this actually makes me sad, or oh, that made me feel really hurt when you yes. when you you know, even though it was like sarcastic, like I didn't, you know, it didn't make me feel good when you said that. Mm -hmm. um, leading with that seems like a much better uh, solution. A hundred percent. And then there are some people who are defensive no matter what, which is one of the four horsemen that John Gottman talks about. Interesting. Uh huh. I was once in a relationship with someone who was like that, and I was like, whoa, this is not going to work for me. Um, and it didn't, but I was very, very clear. And this was after I've done, you know, a lot of work on myself and whatnot. And I was very, very clear. And I said, I need to be able to give you feedback mm. once in a while on how I feel without you immediately getting defensive because it's just, because then we can't get anywhere with this. This is something, this is something you need to work on. <laughs> Somebody who's always defensive. Yeah. Is like, that a, uh, yeah. is that a sign that they have a low self-esteem? insecurities, et cetera? Yeah. Um, there's, there's a, there's a few reasons. It could be that they, it could be that they, um, they saw one of their parents always be like that. So they're, they're like that. It could be that they feel really insignificant to certain members of their family or in life. And so they're projecting that onto their partner, but it's an inside job that needs to be addressed for sure. I mean, yeah. you can't have a conversation with someone who's always defensive. No. Yeah. But like you said, anyone can become defensive if you finger point and blame. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing, I mean, there's nothing, uh, yeah, everybody has the capacity to, be, to get self-defensive, right? I mean, of like course. as long as you're an animal and you have a survival instinct, like that, that the potential for self-defensiveness is in there. But it's, yeah, it's somebody who's like pathologically self-defensive. Yes, constantly. Yeah. I find a good sort of litmus test is, are you able to make self-deprecating jokes about yourself? Mm -hmm. Are you able to be made fun of by your friends? Yes. I know somebody who uh, can, has never made a self-deprecating joke about himself that I'm aware of, can't be made fun of. He's a pretty social guy, popular guy, but just like 
You can't ever make a joke at his expense. Can't ever be sarcastic with him because you know he'll take it the wrong way. And uh, he has to loosen up. He has to loosen up. Yeah. 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 And people get into relationships with people like that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And people also get into relationships with people who are constantly self-deprecating. And that's also another problem. Why is that a problem? If you're constantly self-deprecating, then clearly you don't feel that great about yourself. Interesting. Yeah. That's sort (laughs) of like your defense mechanism. It's almost like, oh, yeah, I can't actually. It's like you feel so. It's almost like people using sarcasm. So like people who are always sarcastic, you can immediately tell, okay, you're really uncomfortable with connect with being close with someone because you're oh the barrier is always sarcasm. Yeah. Wow. I I I yeah. I and feel like <laughs> I think of Woody Allen. It's like, could you be in a relationship with Woody Allen who's always putting himself down? It'd be exhausting. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> or his car I I should say the characters he portrays in his movies. Yeah, but there's always truth there. Yeah, of course. How did you get into this? Like, what's your what's your backstory? Um, so I taught yoga for almost 20 years. So I've always been um, really interested and enamored with the mind and the body connection and self-inquiry and the nervous system and bones and muscles and ligaments and all of that. And I would say about seven years into teaching it, I felt a little bit, I couldn't put my finger on it. I felt like, hmm, is, is this all that there is? Like I felt like I needed more, but I had no idea because the ceiling is really low for yoga teachers and you're always bopping your head against it. And at some point I'm just like, I don't like, I want more, but I have no idea what that is. And at the same time, I had this blueprint of what my life was going to be, which was that I would get married because, you know, that was expected of me. And also that's also what I wanted, get married and have a child, maybe two. And then I would like be teaching yoga with like my baby on my head. I got like this whole like interesting bohemian blueprint, even though I don't regard myself as bohemian, but this was like (laughs) the thing. This was like the thing, right? And, um... And I met someone who would become my husband. And it was, we dated, we were together for like a year and a half before we got married or like, no, almost two years, no, almost two years before we got married. And I would say it was 90% everything that I ever wanted. But the 10% was really, really loud. And I chose to ignore it because of my own self-esteem issues my own whatever daddy issues, whatever the thing was, I did not want to lose that relationship. And so if it meant me zipping up, if it meant me lying to myself, if it meant me lying to him, whatever it is, just to keep that relationship. And also because the 90% was so great. So, but when we got married, it just turned out to be a nightmare for various reasons, which not even worth getting into right now, but it ended up being a nightmare. And I had um, a couple of miscarriages. And um, he, what what presented itself was that he was very much, not at all like my father, but had like mental challenges that my father has. And then he would shut down. Like if he was stressed, he would very much pull away and shut down and avoid. And that's like kryptonite for me. Um, and my, and I've had relationships with men where they didn't do that. And that was much more harmonious. And so that would completely freak me out. And I didn't have, you know, what I would do now with that is that does not work for me. End of story. But back then it was just utter fear. And I did not know how to advocate for myself. Plus, I take full responsibility for the things that I did that weren't fair to him. You know, it it, it takes two. But it was a very, very, very painful, excruciatingly, excruciatingly painful two-year marriage. And um, he very much wanted a child. And I thought I did too. But then there was like, I was having some health problems and then I was starting to doubt my ability to even go through a pregnancy. And um, he wasn't down with that. And there was just also just, there was just so many problems. And then my mom was diagnosed with lung cancer 
Mm-hmm. And usually when that's diagnosed as stage four, you wow. know, it's not, you don't really survive lung cancer. And I um, was very close to my mom. And when she was diagnosed, we were actually, my husband and my ex-husband and I were in a good place and he was supportive. And, you know, that's usually a time where you have to, you should be able to really lean on the person you're in a relationship with heavily. But everything just started coming, crashing down. And, you know, one day he, and we're cool now. It's all cool. But uh, one day he was just like, yeah, I'm not coming home. And like, that was like, I also like, that was during a miscarriage. And my mom, that two days before my mom said, you know, my mom's oncologist told me she's got probably a couple more months to live. And so I was like, okay, so this is what people refer to like your life falling apart. I was like, I am having the most surreal moment right now where um, everything is horrible. Like my world is falling apart. And um, I had just turned 40 and I had all this ridiculous blueprint of like, and, and conditioning that like, how could I be divorced in 40 as a woman? Like no one's going to want me, which is like, couldn't be further from the truth. (laughs) But these were like the things that were going on in my head. And also just like, I had made this promise to myself, I would never be divorced. I mean, the stigma, I mean, I was totally a victim of all that really ridiculous conditioning. And plus I loved him, even though he was totally wrong for me in many ways and in, in important ways. We had, we had great rapport and we were extremely compatible, but in the ways that really matter for long-term, we were wrong for each other. But I couldn't see that. And I'll never forget, you know, thank God for having a dog because I probably never would have left the house if I had a cat. <laughs> <laughs> I would have really been a true story. <laughs> so I um, was sitting outside and it was June 3rd and it was actually the... We, he left June 2nd and June 3rd was our wedding anniversary. And so that like, was just like more salt on the wound. I was sitting outside and this woman who I'd really befriended in the building, who was also a coach, saw me and she came right up to me because clearly I was just like wearing, you know, grief all over me. And we talked and, um, she, she, I was not in, I was very entrenched in the yoga world, wellness world, but not in the personal development world. Hmm. It was a very different, that was a very different world. And she was like, you know, you should really listen to some Tony Robbins. And I was like the infomercial guy, like I wasn't even, and this was, you know, a few years back. So I'm a skeptic and I was like, fine, whatever, I'll do whatever, but I'm going to hate him. And, uh, she sent me some stuff that you can't find online because she'd been to an event and. I listened to something and I felt understood and I, everything started to make sense to me. Like, and I just felt better. So I was like, okay, I'm going to pour all my energy into this because listening to this person is helping me get out of bed. And also what he has to say about relationships is really interesting because I had made a decision, which was unconscious at the time, that I was going to do everything in my power to figure out because my mom was dying, but at the, at, which is obviously the longer grief. But at the time, I was like, how could I have not gotten this right? I was so, I was suffering so immensely for not getting this area of my life right. Like, I just couldn't handle it. And I was like, I'm going to do everything in my power to figure out what the hell went wrong. And then I went on a journey. And I've been obsessed with it ever since. And I poured all my money into this. I've had mentors, I have um, coaches, um, everything about, you know, learning how to just help others. And I leveraged my community because I was a popular yoga teacher in New York and I leveraged that community and I just started teaching this, everything that I was learning because I was getting so much insight into what happened, insight into myself, insight into him because the pro- to process a breakup well you have to be able to see your part and you have to be able to see their part. Hmm. And it's difficult because we go back and forth between blaming them and then blaming ourselves. But we have to see our contribution and we have to understand theirs. And so I was really starting to get it. I was like, wow, I think this might be 
like how yoga felt like a calling, this really feels like my calling. And the rest is history. Wow. Yeah. So a lot of pain got me here. Yeah. Which I think is what is the truth for a lot of people who get obsessed with like down a certain path. Oh yeah. Same for me. Yeah. Is that for you too? Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, my, my, um, my mom also got sick. I mean, she, she had uh, dementia for many years and then. That's so hard. Um, passed due to pancreatic cancer at the end of 2018. And it was, I mean, mm -hmm. I was incre I was the first born small family. Um, and my mom was an only child. So my mom, for, for my mom, her children were everything. Yes. And so, yeah, I was incredible. My mom, I was the closest with my mom. It's so hard. You know, closer with her than I've ever been with anybody. And um, yeah, her, the, the last, I mean, the last decade of her life, pretty difficult. And then the cancer was just like the most brutal, inhumane, awful three months. Like, yes. You know, I'm, I'm, it's like shocking that I, I'm able to like walk on two feet, like after experiencing that. Yes. You know, but I, I credit like my brothers. I have a small family, two younger brothers. Like we were there for one another. Um, and the fact that I've been able to pour everything into my work, into yeah. what I do. It's very healing. Yeah. When you can find, you're like, okay, you, you kind of change the meaning of it all, you know? Yeah, I think... Uh, no one really understands what it's like to lose a parent until they do, and especially when it's the parent that you're very close with. And I too, I've, I'm the youngest, but I have two older sisters. So, and we're, I come from a very, very small family, and I'm, um, we're first generation. My parents were immigrants, so there's not a lot of family. So I understand. And but to see that, to watch someone you love, like a parent die, it changes you forever. It changes you forever. But I. I hope, you know, my hope is that it, it's got to crack your heart open in some way. It just has to. Yeah. Yeah. And it gives you, I think, empathy an empathy, like a degree of empathy for people that, um, that you just don't get f without yes. having seen somebody go through that. Yes. It's very true. Like, you know, I see people now, homeless people mm -hmm. and or decrepit people, old, very old people, disabled people. And my just like my like like my heart opens up. Yes. You just want to help them. Yeah. Because they remind me of my mom. Yes. You know, right. Like it makes me when I see a really old person hobbling down the street, it makes me think of when I had to, you know, when I was at the doctor's office checking in my mom at the reception desk and and she wasn't able to hold her saliva in her mouth and I had to reach over and grab a tissue and wipe it yeah. from her face. You know, it just reminds me of like all those like little moments that, um, you know, if you were like on the outside observing would seem so insignificant, but they're so significant. Oh my God. They change you forever. Yeah. They become burned, etched into your soul. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. Um, crazy. It is crazy. And that my mom died in 2014. So 2018. So, that's fairly recent. Yeah, pretty recent. The grief never goes away, but you learn to live with it. I think that's the only thing. I don't know if that's been your experience. You just kind of learn to still have joy and to carry it differently. I don't know. I don't know if that's been your experience. It's been mine, but it's still hard. Yeah, totally. I mean, it, um, it, uh, Every, you know, every almost mo multiple times a week, not every day, but I get reminded, you know, like uh, I'll see something like I'll yeah. be in a store in the Rolling Stones, which was like her favorite band mm -hmm. or playing over the over the PA. And I just like think about my mom. Yeah. Um, and how much I miss her. But I'm sure she would want you to be really, really open for love. Yeah. I'm sure that would be her wish. Yeah. No, it's been challenging. It's been challenging. I mean, I had a very long term, like on and off again, relationship that ended. Um, and it was, uh, and there were a lot of great things about it, but a lot of really kind of ultimately what became toxic um, about it. And then, you know, she was the one that broke the cycle and she, you know, recently got, recently got married and it's a whole thing. But like, but yeah, I, I went into therapy about a year and a half ago with the intent of like moving on. Mm -hmm. Um or moving forward at least. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, it's been really good. It's been like a good, I think, 
productive journey. The on and off again relationship. Um, I always try to tell people to stay away from that as much as possible, or to try to avoid that as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah, it's very painful. Yeah, just like kind of like opening the wound like again and again yeah, and again. Yeah, yeah. At some point you just have to, you know, let go. Yeah. How do people, is there a way to avoid, I mean, I feel like people, you know, they, uh, sometimes I hear from my, like my, my, my female friends that they end up in the same, well, they end up in relations with the same guy over and over and over again. Not the same guy yes, literally, yes, but yes, like yes. the same archetype. Yes. The, 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 t- the toxic ar- archetype. Yeah. Picker is busted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You need to change. When you change yourself, you change who you're attracted to. And that might mean that, um, you know, people are attracted to people who are bad to, for them for all different reasons. It is something that usually stems from childhood for sure. Um, there's also just cultural conditioning, like women who are attracted to like the quote unquote bad boy because they think that that's the guy who's going to protect her. Like somehow they think that that is masculine when really that's not the man who's going to protect you. That's the man who's going to take from you. Mm. And um, so you have to, if that's the case, you have to recondition yourself to find um, people who are good for you, attractive. And that's part of the inner work. That's understanding yourself, understanding your psychology, getting growing up to a place where you are like, yeah, I want something more than just like, I don't know, attraction. I mean, attraction and chemistry is important. But if it's so strong that you throw all your values out the window, then you need to be dating people who it's a slower burn. Yeah. What about, I mean, I feel like that's a pretty common archetype, like the girl who's just like going after the bad boy. Yes. Getting her heart broken again and again and again. Yeah. But what about the guy who just like wants the Instagram like model Mm -hmm. in air quotes? Well, well, he's just immature Hmm. and he's needing outside validation just in the same way that, that the girl is needing outside validation. It's just wanting the constantly wanting the outside validation um, and not wanting something actually deeper. Yeah. So that could be a mature, a maturity thing, but there, but a more common thing is, you know, wanting to date the broken bird, the one who's always so that you can be the hero and the rescuer and you can be, and you can feel needed because you haven't felt needed growing up. So at least if I'm with someone who constantly needs me, I could constantly be fixing her problems, whether that, you know, and then, then I'm the hero, then I'm significant. Yeah. That's another common, like, uh-huh. um, like those stories never end well. No, they never end well. Hmm. Or they just end in like, or they become really codependent, unfulfilling relationships. Yeah. Cause that person's not that, that person's limping into the relationship in a, in a, in a fractured, you know, way. Yeah, absolutely. They're both complicit in the di- in mm. in the pattern. It's not just one person. People find each other, you know. <laughs> yeah. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there. This always happens to me. I never blah blah blah, <laughs> right? Um or should statements where I should have done that. He should have done this. Um mind reading, fortune telling, catastrophizing, all of these are a list of the common thinking traps that all human beings are privy to.